Uh, how are you, Cher? Oh, I can't hear you. I lost you for a second. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Alhamdulillah. It is so good to have you on here. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I'm just um, making sure the streams. Okay. There we go. So whenever you're ready to get started, we'll get started. Um, I'll just give the the intro and then briefly introduce you and then we can jump right into it, inshallah. Okay, inshallah, I'm ready. If you can okay. hear me, I'm ready. Inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Bismillah, peace and blessings everyone. I'm Aziza and welcome to episode number 19 of Hot Tea. The global, globalist initiative, The Great Reset is well underway. There are many consequences to this next phase of the new world order. One of those consequences is a resurgence of Islamophobia. Our special guest, Sheikh Omar Balak, is with us to further explain. Sheikh Omar is a cognitive psychologist, student of Dr. Isra Ahmed, Sheikh Imran Hussein, and Dr. Omar Zaid. He studied at Al-Azhar in Egypt and has been a local imam for over 20 years. Sheikh Omar, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, Sister Aziza? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Good, alhamdulillah. So, um, yeah, let's get started on the issue of Islamophobia and yes. how this is going to merge with the reset. Yeah, when you, you mentioned to... that, okay, I just want to say when you mentioned that the other day, I just thought it was so profound because I hadn't made that connection. Right now, they're holding off on Islamophobia, or they're trying to, because mm -hmm. they need to get everybody in line, you see. And uh, they don't want the Muslim leaders to say, well, our, const our constituency or our population, our, you know, our followers are, you know, they're like really upset with you guys and we really want to do what you guys do, but, you know, you're really making problems for us. They need everyone's buy-in right now because of the vaccine, because of mm -hmm. COVID. They need everything streamlined right now. But uh, what uh, one of the agendas that is being cooked up for a very long time, and I will give you several, several um, references for this, and uh, for your audience, is your audience going to be like, will they have access to, will they be able to see things that if I want to show something, or uh, I could just mention them too. If no, you no, no, um, you can, you can show them. Okay, okay, inshallah, I will definitely inshallah. do that. Okay. Because there's so much to show. On this issue, and uh, the the so what is it that uh, that they're that they're they are fearful of or that they are against when it comes to Islam? This has to be very properly defined, okay? Because there are many Islams. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, if you read the Rand report uh, by Rand Corporation, uh, it's called Civil Dram uh, Civil Democratic Islam Partners resources and strategies. Um, and this is a, a think tank report that they have written. And, you know, they're very clear on, on certain aspects, you know. So they say, for example, the Islamic world is involved in a struggle to determine its own nature and values with serious implications for the future. We're, so basically, since we are in this internal struggle of authentic Islam, so to say, what is Islam, right? So they have identified, okay, which Islams are they okay with and which Islams are they not okay with? So what they're trying to do is they're trying to target Islam in general, but specifically certain uh, modes of Islam, certain ideas of Islam, certain, uh, certain concepts of Islam, they're because it's going to be completely incompatible with uh, what they, are, they, want, they want in the future. Okay, so uh, so Rand report the Rand uh, Rand Corporation, which is a think tank, one mm -hmm. of the major think tanks. They have come out with many, many, um, many, many. Um, you can say uh, reports on Islam, and anyone can go there and simply type Islam in their search feature, and many of these reports will come out. Okay, now what happens? This is very important to understand. When you see the senators and the congressmen. They don't have time to do research for every single question. That's not what happens. What happens is that they get memos and they get mm -hmm. reports from the think tanks that they like. Uh, they call them opinion makers. So they send these files out to their team and they read it. And then they give a summary of those reports to the senator 
Okay, and so uh, we really do need somebody in the Muslim world to create a think tank that's doing the same thing. Uh, instead of like trying to, you know, meet, send, usually like, you know, Muslims try to like meet the senator and talk to him. It's, it's, it's not, but if you have access to their team and you're just sending them information constantly to each of the congressmen, to each of the senators, like Islam and Turkey, you know, basically trying to mo change the, or to give them an understanding of your point of view, right? Then that has a better way of seeping into the senator than kind of like, establishing these relationships that we have because this is how the think tanks do it mm -hmm. and so anyway and not only to the thing uh, to the congressmen but to the newspapers to the major journalists and so on and so forth all the opinion makers and so this is what they these think tanks do they send their reports to the to the to the opinion makers of society and so they rely on those reports to give them accurate information so rand Rand Corporation is one of them. And then there are many, many others, like the Brookings Institute, uh, like uh, the Council of American Foreign Policy, like Pew Institute. You know, they all have their own, you can say, studies and um, interpretations of what needs to be done. But Rand Corporation is amongst the think, think tanks, probably the top three in the country in terms of influence, in terms of the types of uh, issues that they talk about that affect Muslims. Okay, and so uh, there has been a long discussion after 9-11 about which versions of Islam are compatible with uh, the future and which, which versions of Islam are not compatible. So one of the uh, easy reports to understand in that regard is the report by Rand report called, um, the report is called, the one that I just read from is, is called, um, civil and democratic Islam. Uh, and so, yeah. Okay. Having said that, um, let me then uh, move on to uh, talk more about which uh, Islam is the one that is problematic for the West. Uh, the Islam that is problematic for them is what they have termed political Islam. Okay, an Islam that exercises its authority outside personal life, meaning in the economic, social, political sphere. That if Islam was to manifest itself as a system, in as a as a, you can say that they would see it as a challenge to democracy, or a challenge to socialism. That Islam that they, and if you go to Wikipedia and just, just like, if you even like, if you give me the, um, the share screen, uh, if I could just even show you, they, they have clearly defined a lot of this. So, um, so uh, I share my screen with you. Is that what I need to do? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll just okay. like share with you. Uh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, it's okay. There you go. Uh, okay, so if you go to Wikipedia or just go to Google and type in political Islam and go to Wikipedia, just I'm just showing you how easily these things can be looked at. So if you look at political Islam in its definition, right, political Islam is any interpretation of Islam as a source of political identity and action. So basically, it is the implementation of Islam. Okay. It is the manifestation of Islam. It's the Islamic economic system that wants to do away with interest, for example, and do away with the banks and do away with the paper money. That is the Islam that they have a problem with. They don't have a problem with you buying a mosque. Okay. They think that's a great thing. Uh, you know, people uh, expressing their feelings and their, they have to, you know, human beings want to believe in something. So you want to believe in Islam, believe in Islam. But their attitude is very much the same as their attitude towards many other things that are even very common. For example, they don't mind you opening up kitchen soups to help the poor. But they do mind if you start criticizing that system that creates that poverty. They do not mind you, op you know, helping patients of AIDS. Okay, you have an AIDS hospital, you have special grants for people that have AIDS, but don't criticize that lifestyle. Okay, so I mean, it's, it's, it's this schizophrenic, like they want to help people with AIDS, but they don't want, they want them to continue on that track of that lifestyle at the same time. 
And so it's here. The, they want you to help people that are poor, but they don't want you to criticize the system that creates the poverty. So that Islam that will remove that type of hypocrisy and that Islam that will politically manifest itself uh, is the Islam that they have a huge, huge uh, problem with. And they see that as a challenge for them because um, they see that when the Muslim will is expressed as it was expressed in Algeria, as it was is expressed in Egypt, it was expressed in different places, even Iraq, even in Palestine, that whenever Muslims voted, they always tried to bring in the religious parties. And these religious parties, they want to bring practical Islam into the scene. And so this has become a problem. Now, let me, uh, so, so now that I have defined political Islam as a challenge to them, now you can just simply think of all those issues that, uh, you know, that they see as a, a, a challenge for, for the, what is that political Islam offers that they see a problem with, okay? So that, that is really going to be the question. Why is it that they're so against political Islam, okay? And so uh, over here, you, you know, they've gone to the point of uh, giving markers, okay? And this becomes very important with this whole reset system, which is that, you know how in the U.S., we have, um, we have uh, like a, a FICO, okay? That, you know, we have this kind of like a report, a financial report of you've been paying your bills, you know, you're, if we loan you money, are you gonna be good with your debt, so on and so forth. Well, now China is doing the same thing already, except oh, at so a social sorry. level, okay? So now, once they have these things, and this is from Rand report, the same report, uh, in fact, if you, um, go on the share screen and type mm -hmm. in, uh, and I'm going to show you several of these. This is just like one of the easier ones to identify with and to see the, the depth of at which they're going. Um, if you just simply type in, uh, you know, uh, civil democratic Islam Rand report on another tab. Yeah, yeah, you can do, use the same one, that's fine. Rand report. Okay, if you just go there, uh, just go ahead and click on that. Okay, and uh, you will now find this report. Uh, if you can download the e this uh, PDF file while we're talking. Okay, now as as you're downloading that, I will just talk about it, and then you can see it. It's already open. Actually, huh? It's already open. Oh, it's already open. Yeah. Oh, uh, where? Oh, oh, you probably, can you see it? Uh, no, I cannot. Okay, let me It's see. okay, we can take our time as okay, long as we go can ahead. get, because I have a lot to share when it comes to this. So um, there you go. So now if you just uh, scroll down, uh, just keep scrolling down, uh, go like, uh, just, you don't have to go that far down. Just keep going down, like keep going. This is just the beginning of it. So just keep going down till I say stop. So that's the preface. Okay, and then it's going to discuss what is, you see, okay, just if you could stop here, chapter one, it is, it, it is what is calling markers, okay, so uh, position on key issues, okay, uh, democracy versus human rights, polygamy, criminal punishments, like the Islamic punishments for the criminals, minorities, the women's dress, okay, these are what they consider markers that identify which type of Muslim you are. Okay, so if you are on sites or if you're going to a mosque that is like particularly conservative or if you're, you know, uh, buying online dress that's conservative, if you are saying something on your social media that might be against their standings of the key political, uh, you know, what they understand is the right way versus uh, political Islam being right, how it's expressing itself. So, uh, so if you look at chapter two, it divides people into Muslim secularists, Muslim fundamentalists. Fundamentalism is also essentially defined as political Islam. There's no difference between fundamentalism. And uh, so you could say the way they look at it is terrorism is a subcategory of political Islam. But fundamentalists are Muslims who want Islam implemented as a social reality. Okay. Then you have the traditionalists, which is our scholars from Dar al Alum, Medina University, Islamic University of Malaysia, or Islamabad. So 
if you just go down and then you know it talks about Muslim modernists and which groups to support, which groups not to support, how to uh, you know um, in a way that it will work practically. So you know they'll say don't support the secularists in this case, but support let's say uh, the modernists instead of the secular. So they have this. If you keep going down. And then I'll show you how they've created these markers. And this is just to give you an idea of how this uh, future reset, because you think that uh, how much money did they pay for these people to do this research? Okay. Uh, somebody spent time writing this. If you keep going down, sister, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they uh, what you would call it, uh, the time, the resource, the expertise, the PhDs, and then sending all this out to the opinion makers. It, it doesn't happen unless there is a clear agenda, okay? These things don't happen unless there's a clear agenda. If you keep going down, keep going down, and I want to show you, you keep going down until you see a graph. May I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Have you seen anything on this about um, other faiths, like Christianity no. or Judaism? No, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this is okay. this is a very focused. You don't find like let's support this Buddhist group over this group, and we want this type of Buddhism, and we don't want this type of no, nothing like that. Of course not. Hmm. So uh, now, if you keep going down till you see a graph, you'll see like a, a graph that uh, in which they've tried to highlight. So this is like all the terminologies they're going to use, just to kind of like it shows like how well they're they know Islam. Keep going down, and very soon now, from where you are, you'll see this uh, graph coming up. Okay, and and this is going to be very telling uh, to your audience of the of the the uh, how. Okay, this so one? Here, this table yep. right here. Okay, it's a democracy. Now they have they have like for example regarding democracy. Okay, so you're a radical fundamentalist if you say this. You are a scriptural fundamentalist if you say this. You're a conservative traditionalist if you have this opinion about democracy, okay? And then it goes on to the other categories. This is only uh, three of the nine okay, categories. Human rights, polygamy, okay? What will you say? If you say this, then they have a system in place that as soon as they feel like, oh, you're like, you know, they've the, the fundamentalists and uh, traditionalists and modernists have been further divided into three groups each okay and they have identified what each person is thinking okay and where you belong in each of the categories okay and so obviously they've chosen the particular key issues to convince their the people they're trying to influence right they're not going to talk about riba they're not going to talk about alcohol they're not going to talk about drugs they're not going to talk about you know, marriage, they're not going to talk about the, the other aspects that, that, that are the real problems, okay, but the ones that uh, are problems from a liberal mindset, uh, only those issues they'll bring up, right, so this is, you know, it's just the same as when they're talking about Islam, do they ever bring a Muslim on TV, right, it, so it's the same, it's the same phenomenon, that they're trying to push an agenda, um, that is essentially anti-Islamic because it, it's going to be very hard to get rid of political Islam, especially in the Muslim world. There are always going to be Muslims who want to practice Islam at the legal level, at the political level, at the social level, at the economic level. And so there are different ways to, you know, hijab, for example, right? So you have hijab here, but you have the, now they have, if, now when you go in the next part of the chapter two, it starts discussing strategies on who to support, who not to support, which version of Islam to support. So now you have a complete computer program, okay, that what, that's doing what, is, that is basically trying to identify people in society and trying to mark where they are in this scale, okay, and so, uh, so this is just a summary of that uh, chart that you saw. So if you go at the bottom uh, of this chart, uh, then it'll tell you who to support and why to support them and who to give money to. This means that they're spending money on these particular groups. Uh, so if you just uh, go over here to the bottom a little bit. May I make a comment? <laughs> because yeah. these things that you're speaking about, I mean, we can see it happening right now 
you know, there's definitely support for certain individuals who say certain things. Absolutely. And, you know, different groups. This is their, this is their agenda. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be aware as Muslims too. So yeah. finding partners for promotion of democratic Islam options. Okay. So supporting the secularists, how to support them. Okay. Supporting the traditional scholars, give them their Islamic schools, give them their madrasas, give them their, as long as they work against the, fun, the, the ones that want Islam expressed. Okay. So essentially uh, they don't want you practicing Islam fully, completely. That is right. Okay. Islam as a deen, as a system. It's a way of life, yes. As a way of life, they don't mm -hmm. want that. Yeah. But if you live in, you go to your mosque, you pray five times a day. See, the purpose of religion this is very very important the purpose of religion in modern times okay and in postmodern times the purpose of religion is supposed to be a psychological pill to help you deal with suffering that is the purpose okay the purpose of religion is not to tell you what is right and what is wrong and what economic policies should be what businesses uh, policies should be, what social policies should be, what political policies, that's not the role of religion in, in, in the framework of modernity, okay? The, the, in the framework of modernity, the role of religion is limited to like the, you can say this sanitation department, okay? So they have chaplains in the prisons and they have chaplains in the hospitals, people that need God, people that are suffering, Okay, that is the role of religion as defined by modernity. And Islam, the problem they have with Islam is that Islam oversteps that boundary. Okay, every religion is contented with, uh, you know, doing charity work. Uh, every religion is, is, is contented with, you know, uh, I, I, helping the poor people, helping the, uh, the people that are uh, helpless, every religion, every human being is okay with that. But don't tell us what we should do in the economic forum. Yeah, don't overhaul the whole system. You don't, yes, don't do that. Okay, don't challenge the system. Okay, in fact, if, the, it, is, if, in fact it, is, if it is creating poverty, uh, then you know that's how you got your job as a priest. Right, and you're helping them, and so you're helping. Uh, you're putting. You're helping us with bandage. Your your role becomes the bandage of that oppressive system. So, like uh, you know, think of the U.S. Right, and all the Christian reverends that we have here uh, in the U.S. Their role is to perpetuate, and this is why the problems don't get solved. Because if you work within the system, you're just perpetuating the same problem. You're just acting as a bandage, and so. Uh, anyway, so I've said enough about that particular point, but let's go on to a few other uh, points, inshallah ta'ala. So uh, if you, for example, I, I can uh, refer to many um, uh, reports, but this is one example of, uh, of, uh, of think tank reports. This is one, and I can easily mention seven or eight. Okay. May I and ask another all... question? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Along the lines of this, who do you think, how do you think they gathered this data? Do you think there was elements of infiltration involved? Oh, definitely there is that. But, uh, you know, you have the, uh, what happens is exactly what Fir'aun did with the magicians. You see, you find the intellectuals who agree with your elitist uh, position. Okay. And you say, hey, can you generate, wouldn't it be great if we generated a report about Islam? <coughs> And they're like, yeah. And he's like, you know, if you do that, I'll give you $2 million <coughs> to, your, to your research department. Mm -hmm. And they get their money. And they hire those people that are willing to be sellouts. And many of them are Muslims. Many of them are Muslims. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's this Muslim guy from Pakistan who works for, I think it's called the Hudson, Hudson Institute. A terrible person, terrible. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, and they're Muslims. And so they can claim they know Islam. Right. And, uh, you know, and so, uh, so yeah, and so the political is so now that you understand that political Islam is so it, this follows a certain logic. Mm -hmm. The logic is that political Islam does not fit into what 
into the what they see as a good society okay islam is a challenge to the riba system islam is a challenge to a system that believes in sexual anarchy uh, islam is a challenge to a system that believes in family life uh, so so these things uh, you know become a real uh, problem for that so now they have to find a way to uh, demean islam not as uh, you know demean islam uh, you can say um, if you uh, you know demean islam at the political as a political system specifically so what do they do now these things are not by mistake so you have for example the uh, the the islamic state that they called what the islamic state group in iraq baghdadi and all of that so you know they want to create this kind of like oh islamic state is like this you know they wanted to create a a a, a narrative that islamic state is like what uh, taliban is like in afghanistan for example and uh, they 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 created these fake models of islam and uh, you know gave them weapons and everything in order to demean political islam Okay, so their target specifically, I mean, their, their target is Islam in general, because of, again, because of certain norms and ideas Islam has, but they certainly don't want to tolerate that at all when it comes to the actual manifestation of that at all, because, you know, then the people will see, wait, uh, this is actually not too bad, the, living yeah. without a robust system. Right. You know? And uh, so... So if you like, for example, look at if we go back to the sh uh, share screen, if you go back and look at uh, what is happening in the world slowly, uh, if we go back to the share screen, if you type in financial times, uh, financial times, and then type in what is behind Austria's plan to outlaw political Islam. Okay, uh, no, uh, Austria's plan to, okay. Outlaw political Islam, yes. So what is behind Austria? So here's Austria basically saying you should not be able to allow to be talk about what? Islam as a political system. Okay. It's not even on the table. It's okay for Jews to have Israel when they can express their political will, but it is not okay for Muslims to have their political will expressed. Okay. And so you know, they, they also use the word Islamist, as you see there, okay? So Islamists are basically people that are in favor of Islam as a political, economic, social, you know, there's the, uh, the you can say the new world order, but then there's the just world order. They don't want the just world order to um, be expressed uh, because that would be a great problem. For this. this is what they really, at the end of the day, you know, that what they really uh, don't want. And you can see this ha emerging, like I said, right now is a quiet phase. This is the quiet before the storm, okay? And uh, uh, if you go to, for example, type in, uh, just to give you an idea, Hoover Institute, H-O-O-V-E-R uh, -E Institute, and then how to counter political Islam, if you just type that. Uh, Uh, how to counter, uh, no, if you typed in how to counter, no, same thing, just a space bar and how to counter political Islam. There you go. Okay, so this is another institute uh, talking about basically the same phenomenon. Well, look at the author. How... Check, look at the author. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there you go. So they'll take the articles by these people who wow. are also paid, by the way. Oh, right? yeah. And they become representatives in the media. And her husband's a Zionist. And, they, so. and, 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 you know, they have a sob story to share. Yeah. Okay? And uh, their sob story sells, you know, and makes Islam look really bad. Mm -hmm. And, but, the, you know, uh, what, it, what, you know, but what is she against? She's not against, uh, she's against political Islam, mm -hmm. specifically. Absolutely. And then Islam in general. Okay. And then, and so this is this is how this is how this goes, and so uh, you know, uh, she, Hoover Institute hires her, 
uh, and and maybe the problems were Muslims. Maybe the Muslims gave her a bad impression of Islam, or her parents didn't do a, a very good job, right? But the point is that who's using her? Who's publishing her? Who's promoting her, right? Whose agenda is being used here, right? She's a pawn probably herself, right? And she doesn't even probably realize it. Uh, so when, for example, it came to Afghanistan, because Afghanistan again, you know, in one order of the the uh, of Mullah Umar, all the heroin uh, production and cocaine production and all that was stopped, and uh, all of the um, anyway. That's that's. But if you type in uh, what's her name, uh, if you type in uh, um, uh, you type in uh, that lady's name, her name is. Uh, I forget that lady that was being promoted from Afghanistan. Uh, Malala? Malala. Yes. Huh. <laughs> you know, so what is it that she's uh, speaking against? She's basically speaking against political, political Islam. You see, these people are being used against political Islam. And, you know, they, we don't even know who these people are. They just come out of nowhere. Right. They write a book. They make it a bestseller. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, they write a book, they make it a bestseller, and then, you know, uh, she becomes like an activist. Now. Yeah, Nobel Prize right. winner. Nobel Prize, can you believe that? <laughs> you know, uh, and what is she doing? She's basically speaking against the snub. Mm -hmm. And so... In a veiled uh, manner, you know, they, they use those, those catchphrases and those politically correct terms. They're, yeah, they're, dog, then, they're dog whistling. And, and it goes much deeper than that. See, they even have a problem with the Arabic language. Okay. Hmm. So like, for example, they'll say the language of Arabic language is a language of fundamentalism. So for example, if you look up just as a reference, you know, uh, Daniel Pipe talks about this. Many people talk about this. Many intellectuals are talking about Daniel, even the Arabic language is a problem because it leads people to understand Quran. Basically. Jake, what's his name? Daniel who? Uh, no, uh, just type in, uh, uh, this is an article at Washington Post. It's called Allahu Akbar isn't a scary phrase. So this is just to give you an example. And this is like a, uh, not like uh, the best example because over here it's a little bit positive, okay? But they are intellectually discussing the, um, the, the effect of the language itself. Okay, so if you wanna see, this is like a positive, Right. And if you want to see the negative side, just type in Daniel Pipes and the language of terrorism. You know, and so they, they you know, they have even discussed if anyone's learning Arabic language, it's expected that they'll become Muslim. Right. The language of ter uh, uh, terrorism changes. OK. The language of terrorism. You see this language issue. So they even have a problem with uh, you can say Fusha Arabic, Arabic, uh, classical Arabic. Hmm. You see, because it, if you don't know classical Arabic, you even if you know Arabic, you can't understand Quran, which is what they're happy with. But learning classical Arabic uh, is, is a very big problem for them because it takes you on the pathway to becoming a fundamentalist. And so you'll find these people. Uh, let me uh, share with you, for example, um, Have you seen this one? Uh, Arabic as a terrorist language. There you go. Okay. So uh, the issue here is, you know, there's another article on, uh, on it's called uh, Why the West Seeks to Vilify Political Islam just to make the point that I'm not the only one saying this, right? This is something that's understood even by other intellectuals, uh, why the West seeks to vilify. So here, the point is to vilify, right? To make it a villain. And this is why you're gonna have a lot of people in this particular phase of the history, a lot of the youth, they're gonna try to leave Islam or think about leaving Islam because of this vilification. This, uh, they don't wanna be part of this. Right. And so you, you'll find more people talking against Islam on YouTube and other social medias now than ever before. And it's it's all 
you know, uh, again, remember what Islam is, Islamism is. Okay, Islamism is that fundamental Islam that, in their definition, wants to p implement Islam. So Islamism is by no means the scary, you know, thing that they want to call it. Okay, but who are at the forefront of this? Also, are the people of the Arab world? Yeah, it's Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. that is uh, it, more against Islam than even the West in some ways. Okay, it is CC in Egypt who is more against Islam. So, so the, so the, because. So the West fears uh, Islam for its reasons. There are historical reasons because of the Crusades and uh, because of Christianity. You know, whenever people share borders, there's going to be some antagonism, some something going on there, right? And you have people sharing a border for like a thousand some years. Well, there's going to be some issues, right? Then on top of that, you have the uh, Islam as, you know, when it especially comes to the reset, they definitely don't want that. But here's the issue that the uh, if if Islam was to become political in the Muslim world, then where, what would happen to all these dictators? You know, what would happen to MBS? What would happen to CC? What would happen to the the king of uh, this little island and that little island? You know, Dubai and all these little islands that they have Jordan, the king of Jordan and so on and so forth. Then they, they have no future. And so then they have to tell the West, hey, we're with you. You know, this Islam is really not really, really bad. You know, we want to like uh, do away with Islam because it, doing away with Islam is basically their way of ensuring their insurance. It's their insurance policy for the future that their children and children and children will rule. Right. And, and now, uh, in fact, Israel is using that to their advantage. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But, uh, but the point is that uh, the Muslim world, the leadership of the Muslim world is more against Islam, political Islam, Islam as it expressed in society, because Islam doesn't believe in kingship. And so now you have a problem, you know, and then that would mean that the elite in the Muslim world will uh, cease to be able to practice, um, you know, their elitist ways of living, because Islam would come in the middle. You know, they won't be having access to their alcohol. They won't be having access to their, um, you know, their women on the side. They won't have access to all these things. And so they don't want that. They won't ha have access to the political power that they had before. So there is a, you can say, a, uh, there is a antagonism towards Islam from within. And there is an antagonism towards Islam on the outside but particularly when it comes to trying to understand uh, Islam, what role should Islam have in the future? What role can Islam, what role can Muslims and Islam, what should be the limits of that role? And so they're not okay with political Islam. They're not okay with what sometimes people call khilafa or people call iqamutuddin, the expression of Islam as fully in a land, right? Uh, and so, so this is this is where we are. Um, and so, a lot of things are being done. Uh, you know, if you look at, for example, the Great Reset, uh, uh, the Great Reset. Uh, if you look at the the agenda uh, uh, called the 2030. Okay, the agenda of 2030. Out of the 17 points that they have, I believe, you know, a lot of those things they work against Islam. You know. The, if you look at, for example, uh, um, yeah, if you can, if you want to look that up there, Agenda 2030, okay, and uh, Transforming Our World, okay, this is the sustainable, this is a branch of the United Nations that every single Muslim country has signed on to, by the way, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, so their, their agenda here is to basically, they have uh, 17 topics or 17 things okay and this is their declaration you can read it and you know it's worded very well everything is you know outside is worded very well uh but the point that needs to be understood here is that there is a new agenda out there okay and this agenda when you <clears throat> study it deeply okay uh, has some Not good it has things elements in it that are very anti-Islamic. And uh, now uh, what you uh, also 
uh, can consider is that most Muslim, I'm just going to throw this out there, we can uh, go into details if you feel like, but, you know, Muslim countries don't get loans now because, you know, they all are under loans. Every single country is in a loan and they don't give loans based upon, uh, they don't get loans based upon if you can pay things back. That's right. like not even the new criteria. Now mm -hmm. that now you get loans based upon if you're going to go go with the agenda. Absolutely. You know, if you're going to go with the agenda, we might give you a loan to bail you out. So you look good in front of your people. OK. And so this is where uh, things are going now. Also, like, for example, when we look at, for example, uh, Macron, the guy in France, uh, you know, his war on Islam. Uh, what is it? You know, that whole uh, Macron ask. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, if you there's an article called uh, Macron's War on Islamism. Okay, so Islamism, that fundamental Islam, that Islam that wants to express itself. So what they don't want is this. They have a lot of concerns at many different levels, but one of the major concerns. Uh, uh, Macron declares war on Islamism. Now, what is Islamism? As I explained before, political Islam is Islamism. Now, as the population of uh, Muslims increase in Europe, they're going to have a bigger political say. They're going to have more influence on society. And so they are, uh, and you know, see, look at the way they word it. You can't fight violence with more violence. So, you know, this kind of like, but the real concern is uh, are they going to uh, you know, bring political Islam. Are they going to start expressing Islam in the Europe? That's the thing that they don't want. They don't want. Uh, uh, in fact, there's another article called Macron's War on Islamism is Europe's future. Okay. And so now another thing that has happened here that needs to be understood is the relationship between Christianity and Islamophobia. Mm. Yeah. So uh, here, Macron's War on Islam is uh, on Europe's future. Yes. Okay, so this is another think tank, okay? So, uh, Emil Macron's war on Islamism is Europe's future. That is the future, they're saying, okay? That is the future. And so, th they, are, uh, they are beginning to get prepared for that. And just as soon as this whole vaccine thing, you know, uh, puts itself in place, slowly but surely, they're, they're not going to make... Uh, like a big noise like Trump did when he was, you know, speaking against Islam and Muslims, but they're going to definitely move forward in a way that uh, isolates uh, those elements of Islam that they have a, feel are a threat. And so, you know, uh, one day people might wake up and, uh, you know, you can't find me on the internet and, uh, and they might not find you on the internet now, <laughs> you know. So that's so that's just the reality of it uh, as it is. Um, and so France is going to probably be uh, a big leader in this uh, because Islam has had a, uh, France has had a big uh, issue uh, with or against Islam for a long time because of its history, which I won't go into right now. But you can also look at this other article, um, Austria's. Uh, fight uh, to uh, Austria, uh, Austria's fight, uh, uh, type in Austria's uh, EU to do more fight political Islam. EU to do more fight. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. So that's that's basically it. Uh, that political Islam is is their is their big problem, uh, and and so there is being a lot written. Almost every university has done some sort of research on the issue of political Islam and uh, what to do about it. Uh, if you look at the Cairo Review of Global Affairs and Failings of Political Islam, if you type that, uh, Cairo. Uh, the Cairo Review of Global Affairs and Failings of Political Islam. Yep. 
you know, and who are writing these articles? Muslims are writing these articles, right? Muslims are writing these articles. And they're like, oh, political Islam has failed. So and, this idea kind of like, look at the okay, picture that they give you. Look who it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jamal al yes. Yeah. And so, uh, so, so this is kind of like, uh, uh, if also another article I can share with you is in Europe, Calls for grow, grow, calls grow louder for united front against political Islam. That's right. And uh, so here, and then, uh, you know, the, Basically, Europe is is going to take the lead in this, and then you know the U.S. and Australia, and then the rest of the world is easy after that. Uh, all the elite are going to acquiesce to what the these elites are doing. Uh, let me just share with you how this works sociologically, so that you have a, a little bit the audience can have a better understanding. You see, you have an elite in, let's say, the European elite. And then you have a Muslim country elite. So both countries have their elite groups. Okay. Now, this elite group, the Muslim elite group, tries to copy this elite group, right? And they intermarry amongst each other. They are of the same economic status. But they, they tell these people what to do. When the populace doesn't accept what they do, what happens? The gap between the political leaders and the population gets bigger, but their closeness to these people gets closer, okay? Because they're like, oh yeah, our people are stupid. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they, look, it works fine in America. Why doesn't it work over here? Well, the reason that, that it doesn't work, the population doesn't accept it is because of the difference in the value systems and they don't necessarily, they see it and they don't see it. And it is exactly as the way the Quran describes, as that when the Quran says, and when they meet the believers, what do they say? They say, we believe. And when they're alone with their leaders, with their devils, with their devilish leaders, you can say, no, no, we're with you. Okay. We're just mocking them. We're just making fun of them. We're just going along with them. So, you know, they'll come to some banquet, some Islamic conference, some Islamic whatever. And, you know, they'll show, they'll come out and pray with the public in Eid, let's say, the Eid prayer. Uh, and uh, and then, you know, and then they'll make a few statements that we don't like America and we don't like this and we're not going to accept and we're all for Islam. And then when they get questioned about it, they're like, oh, no, 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 that's, we're just driving our public, you know, we're just satisfying our public, we're with you, okay? So this is kind of like what's going on. There's another article, if you kind of like, just to get an idea of, you know, how worried they are about, uh, because, you know, there's a billion Muslims in the world. And the, the idea that Islam will eventually find its way to be established somewhere is a real fear for them. You know, it could be Somalia, it could be Pakistan, it could be, you know, they, they don't care. I mean, they care about Iran in as much as they can use Iran against Sunni Shia warfare, like divide and conquer. That's there. But what is it that they really fear? What they really fear when it comes to Iran is what if Iran shows its Islamic model, which is not a fully Islamic model, but whatever little they have done uh, that is positive because of Islam, right? Uh, what if they, the public gets to know that? So now you have to vilify, okay? So like you can look at another article, for example, trajectories of political Islam, Egypt, Iran, and Turkey. So these are case studies uh, in this particular um, uh, trajectories of political Islam. This uh, third one you have here in the library. So they're so, con I want you to try to grasp the, the depth of this. 
that they're so concerned of, of everything, even the language. They're concerned about everything, what you were thinking, mark, marking the different modes of thinking, okay? Mar looking at case studies, like, okay, what happened with political Islam in Egypt? What happened with political Islam in Iran? What happened with political Islam in Turkey? This is how much they're worried about this because the biggest challenge to this new world order, the biggest challenge to the great reset is political Islam. And now, now it's not, it's even beyond that. You see, they've already conquered the Muslims politically and economically. All that lives is one layer and that's socially, mm. the social values. <laughs> and so like one of the social values that they want to promote as you very much may know is less population. Right. Less population means less kids, mm -hmm. okay? Less kids means uh, that, that stands against Islam, okay? That means, now how will they do less kids? Well, let's use the women, let's force them to, you know, let's, let's champion them as workers. Feminism. The, the feminism, okay? Feminazism, <laughs> right? So right. now they want to come into your house and dictate the mm -hmm. social engineering as it is going. They want to come into your house and dictate how your Islamic values should be even inside your house. So this is where they are, okay? Uh, if you look at online, uh, you can look at that. Uh, Beijing, uh, Beijing uh, Women Conference 2000. I think it was uh, 2000, year 2000. You can look that up, okay? Uh, Beijing 5. Women 2000. Over here in this particular conference in the United Nations, they talked about that if a woman becomes a prostitute, it's like work. She should be paid for it. Yeah, she's called sex worker now. Yeah, sex worker. Mm -hmm. And this was down in 2000. Okay. So, so they have these agendas that are now their challenge basically is how can they re social engineer the Muslim social, the, the, at the social level, the families. Then what remains of Islam then? Political, gone. Economics, gone. Social, then will be gone. Then all you have is your halal and haram. And even that, they've manipulated and changed, okay? Genetically changed that. So while we're arguing if it's hand slaughtered, and while we're <laughs> arguing if it's zabiha, we said right. bismillah akbar, it's genetically not even the same thing that they used to slaughter 500 years ago. So... Uh, that now takes us to the whole issue of, you know, transhumanism and, and, and kind of like merging and changing us fundamentally as who like we are. One more thing I'd like to add, it's even in the schools now with the LGBTQ. LGBT, agenda. there you go. Yeah. You know, and you have, uh, what is it? They have these books now that are in Arabic in the schools. Yeah. 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 I, I believe that completely. Yeah, absolutely. They would do that, you know, and, uh, uh, there's another think tank, just to kind of like give you an idea. Uh, there's a very big think tank that especially liked by the, the, the Democrats. Um, it's called uh, Foreign Affairs. The Council of Foreign Affairs. It's mm -hmm. Foreign CFR, Affairs. In, in, right? Yeah, see, uh, no, no, no. You can just type in um, the failure of political Islam, foreign affairs. I think I have that one. Okay. The failure of political Islam, uh, and then type in foreign affairs. Okay, there you go. And so, you know, here you have uh, this, you know, uh, kind of like uh, the promotion of this book and this idea of political Islam. And so we have to, therefore, restudy political Islam, meaning Islam as a system. Because this is what they have a problem with. And studying Islam as a system will help us also understand what they are doing and what Islam brings to the table. And so, uh, you know, so Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, uh, they want, they don't, so, so they, they'll be very happy uh, on, they'll be very happy to give you an MSA room. They'll be very happy to give you a masjid. They'll be very happy with all your spiritual uh, things as long as it does not become something practical. If that spirituality begins to have political or uh, that spirituality begins to manifest itself 
uh, practically, they don't want that. You know, that's what they don't want. And so this is really the, this is the way of the future. We already know China's stance on Islam. And we already know what China has been doing to Muslims. So now when they bring this Chinese uh, system of, you know, uh, social uh, credit, you know, social measurement of, and they can use this RAND report or something similar to determine what type of Muslim you are and what is your number on the scale of society of being a normal person or a good person in their scale. You know, this person doesn't go to the bars. This person is going to the mosque. You know, that's a red flag right there. And then he's also talking about uh, politic, you know, uh, the Islamic economic system, or he's talking about the Islamic political system, or he's talking about Muslims having a future as a, as a, you know, as a civilization, you know, that system is going to totally like try to bar a person like that. And right. so, you know, so th this is, uh, so they're trying to normalize in the minds of the people, all these un-Islamic concepts and try to make them beautiful in the eyes of the people. And so this is what we're up against. It's, and, and they have the money, they have the think tanks, they have the research. And, uh, and then there's people like me and you who just, you know, we, but Allah puts more barakah in our work sometimes than, than he puts in, in their, their millions of dollars, Absolutely. you know? So inshallah khair. Inshallah. So. This is mind blowing. I mean, some of it I knew, but you took it to a completely different level and you have receipts. So, subhanAllah. Um, do you have time for some questions? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, this is a moot point, but I just have to ask you just to hear you say it until people can hear you say it too. Where are our leaders? Why, why is it that, you know, we have to, like-minded people have to scour the earth to find people who are uh, speaking about these issues that are so important, that are connecting the dots between Islam and the world that we currently live in. Yeah, um, the history of that is like this. When modernity came to the Muslim world, uh, there were three reactions. One reaction was, oh, this is great. Let's accept this. One reaction was, oh, no, no, this is very bad. So we will close the doors of understanding what they are all about. English is haram, wearing pants is haram. That was the initial reaction, right, in the early 18th century. And to some degree, it made a sense from that perspective of sitting there that, you know, why are you going to wear pants? These are the people that are killing us. Kind of like, you know, right. it had not become global yet. It was like, it was, you were still wearing your traditional clothes. And, but, but the idea was disengagement, complete dis disengagement from the West and basically saying anything from the West is haram. And the result of that was that we didn't understand the enemy. And so when they were doing things, they were doing good things and they were doing bad things. And they're like, see, look at this good thing that they're doing. They're making hospitals for us. I'm talking about the Muslim countries. I'm talking right. about Egypt and India and Pakistan and where they came and took over. They brought they good, brought a better government system than we had with our monarchs, okay? They brought better hospitals. They brought better institutions. They brought better universities. They brought a lot of things that Muslims were like, okay, this isn't that bad. You know, but what happened, this all came at the cost of losing political. Remember, all of this starts with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Right. Right. So that's the first thing to go. And uh, and so, you know, so the, the religious people, their response was kind of like Ashab al -Kahf, the people of the cave. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to go to our cave and we'll come back when everything is better. And so the ulama, they were not trained to deal with the West, the scholars. And the people that were not ulama, when they got educated, they essentially, all of them got educated in a Western system. Okay. They got, they got, they got educated uh, via uh, Western models, Western curriculums, Western-based schools. Okay. So like if you're in Pakistan, you're doing O levels and A levels like they do have in England, same mm -hmm. thing. And uh, so the point is that uh, 
then the elite, the people that could afford the education, right? They were all grown up in this Western model. And even in that, further, if I may uh, indulge in that, is that they were mostly taught to become engineers and doctors. And engineers and doctors are basically, they're not thinkers. Uh, they're like, uh, you know, computer engineers, like they look at a problem and they solve it. It's like solving a math equation. Okay, you have this symptom, you have this symptom, you have this symptom, you're taught, you're not questioning society, right? You're not becoming a professor, you're not becoming a teacher, you're not a sociologist, you're not a philosopher, you're not a, you're not a, a psychologist, you're not an economist. And so now you have the economists and the sociologists and the psychologists telling the doctors and engineers how they need to organize their society, right? And so while a scientist can only make a bomb, but it's the political scientist that tells you where to throw the bomb. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we didn't have people in social sciences. We didn't have people in humanities. We didn't have people in liberal arts. We didn't have people in the media. We didn't have people in all these key uh, places we just put all our energies in it. So, so even in the educated sphere, okay? So the majority is uneducated because they don't have money in the Muslim world. And then for the little that was educated, the thrust was become a doctor, become an engineer. I'm talking about the Muslim world, okay? And uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, and those people that did become professors and those people that did win in social sciences, whoever studied Freud thought Freud is right. Because we, they, they promote these professors as prophets. Yeah. And you did not have people that had a strong religious foundation as well as a strong foundation in being able to critique the Western thought, which means you have to first know it to be mm. able to critique it. You didn't understand the Western thought the way Imam Ghazali understood Greek thought and wrote the Hafatul Falasafa in which he destroyed, uh, you know, Greek philosophy or the way Imam Nathamia did the same thing. But because we didn't have people that were under, you know, scholar in the madrasa in the old madrasa system, I'm talking about 80 years ago, they still did study Socrates because of Imam Ghazali, because he destroyed their thoughts. So they were, but we didn't study the new thinkers. We didn't study Newton and Einstein and Freud and all these other uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche and what they were saying. And so the ulama were, our scholars, they were completely blind to the, the movers and the thinkers and the shapers of the modern world. And, and so what is happening is the ulama are taking the lead by the pop populace, except in certain issues like what's halal, what's haram, how to pray, how to read Quran. In that, they had the control. But where is society going? Where is the trends of society? Where are we going to go politically? Where are we going to go socially? Where are we going to go economically? The people were going following the Western model. And so how could there be leadership in a situation like that? And so the ulama, they kept their eyes closed. And uh, the elite, they had uh, their full training from the West. Okay, And uh, the West took full advantage of that. You know, how stupid do you have to be that when, uh, you know, uh, what's it, Henry Kissinger comes to Saudi Arabia and tells Saudi Arabia, you should sell oil in dollar instead of your own money. That's like, you know, I, I come to, if, if I have one currency and you have another currency and I come to your house and say, sister, you know, you're not to be, you know, uh, against women, but just give it as an example, I, I say, sister, you're selling this, you know, baked goods. Why don't you just do it in my currency instead of your own currency that will make you powerful? Why don't you sell it in my currency that'll make me powerful? And you agree to that. Like how, how you know, how, how backward do you have to be to accept something like that? So yeah. when America goes to Saudi Arabia and says, oh, don't sell in reals, which would then become have a global currency, real would have become, but, you know, sell in the dollar and we'll protect you. And, uh, you know, so Saudi Arabia says, okay, yeah, that seems like a good idea. I, I can go with that. So, I mean, the point is, is that it is, it took a long time to find a few scholars that were able to merge the two, the Islamic tradition, and also knowing the Western tradition, and to be able to critique uh, it, with a critical eye. 
you see, uh, it is the opposite. It's like an, uh, it's the opposite of Orientalism. Orientalism is to take things of the East and put it under the microscope and say, oh, why do you do this? Why do your women do this? Why do your guys do this? Why do you have jihad? Why do you believe in violence? You're putting every, it, it, turning the tables is like us saying, oh, why do you lie to your children about Santa Claus for like seven, eight years? Right. And making like and then writing like books on it and promoting it and having institutions about it and, you know, promoting it through the institutions that these people are so stupid. They lie to their children till the age of seven and eight. And then, you know, you have this other custom called Halloween. How so stupid is that? And, you know, you just there if you want to put any civilization under a microscope, you can find hundreds of things. You know, what type of civilization is this that rapes women every two minutes? Imagine a few books of that, that would be promoted everywhere, Right. you know? So the thing is, is that we need to now do that. We need to deconstruct Western thought and reconstruct the Islamic thought, okay? And so this is the, the intellectual work that needs to be done uh, for the Muslims and for Islam to stand a chance, for Islam to stand a chance. I'm not looking at, what the Prophet said will happen, what Nabi Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that will happen, right? There's no doubt. But we have to operate based upon the reality of the situation we're in. We need Muslim intellectuals to come together. We need to be able to criticize. Now, now forget about what was. Now we're coming into this whole new crossroads of the Great Reset. We need critical eyes on this. Otherwise, we'll be behind again. Because whatever we were able to criticize the West for until now, it's like, you know, it's a new world. It's gone. Yeah. And so you need critical eyes starting now. And uh, so, uh, so, that when, uh, so, so, so that we can wake people up and say, hey, there's, there's a big problem with the way things are going. And so Muslims, we are, you know, Allah said, uh, uh, he made us uh, the middle ummah to be the ones that that bring out humanity out of these problems. It should not be David Icke out there. It should be a Muslim out there. Exactly. Right? Absolutely. You know, it should not be, it should be, it should be the Muslims that are telling the people of the world, hey, that is satanic. We need mm -hmm. to move into this direction. Instead of our Muslims listening to it, you know, this guy, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the issue is that the lack of us being able to do that. And uh, the lack of the intellectuals in the Muslim world to be able to do that, that, that is the problem. It's the, it's the, it's the problem is us. Well, that leads me to my next question. So what can we do? Someone at my level and my listeners, what, what can we do? What should we be preparing for as well? I guess it's a two-part question. Um, one thing we need to do is we need to get like minds together. That is the beginning of anything good anything good or anything bad really is like minds need to mm. network. They need to know it. And, you know, they need to have an exchange of notes. Uh, we need to go away from, uh, because in the Muslim world, we've been doing something similar to the Christian world, which is we've been arguing about useless things. Absolutely. And, uh, and the purpose of that was what? Arguing about useless things for what purpose? Keep to, keep my sheep, to keep my sheep. Exactly. You're 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 authentic Muslim if you're with me, and you're not authentic Muslim if you're with him, right? Or her. Right and conquer. Yeah. And so we need to get out of that. We need like-minded people that have really sincere concern for Allah and, and His Deen, and uh, for for like-minded people to start networking, and. Uh, and, and then uh, by that, that's one thing that needs to be done. Second is the intellectual work that I mentioned that needs to be done. We need people that are full-time, literally full-time studying uh, what's going on, why is it going on, why is Islam better? We need a full-time think tank. And Alhamdulillah, Islam is so strong and so beautiful that it, with, see, they have to use all these resources and all these institutions mm -hmm. because they're on the wrong side. So mm -hmm. they need a lot more energy to produce something. Yeah. For us, alhamdulillah, if we have even 40, 50 Muslim brains that are intellectually capable of, of dissecting the Great Reset and the Western civilization as it is in the direction it's moving right now, uh, we will have our job accomplished. It'll be that easy.
you see. Uh, but it has to be people that understand the Quran. And uh, as a minimum of uh, requirement, I would say that they have to at least understand the Quranic Arabic. And then they need to dive into Western thought and the great reset and the, the thinkers behind this. Uh, who, are there, who are the people that are calling for this? Understanding them, their personalities, their thoughts, and all of that needs to be dissected. And then we need to uh, practically move in a direction of, okay, what do we do at our local levels, right? Uh, we know for even the level of having a discussion of, we know, for example, many people are going to take the vaccine, even if they don't want to, because they need their jobs. Well, what do we do in that case? What should they do in that case? We need to offer real solutions to people that are even within those that are concerned. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, the other thing Muslims need to do is that at their local level, uh, so there's the, the global level of meeting of the minds, but at the local level, if you can establish four or five people, six people, seven people, any jama'ah, people coming together that are like-minded and getting ready, okay, uh, at whatever capacity, if you can buy a land, you have money to buy a land, buy a land. If you don't have money to buy a land, it's okay. Do what Allah has made you capable of doing. Buy solar uh, flashlights together, for example. Flashlights that are work based upon solar. You know, buy maybe some uh, weapons to uh, safeguard yourself, defend yourself. Um, so whatever you can do at your local level, and then create local models. Create uh, what, you know, Sheikh Imran Hussein calls the Muslim village. But if you can't create a village, uh, where people can go somewhere, uh, let's say, then do whatever you can at your local level. Uh, increase your understanding. Uh, you know, everyone write lo lo articles for your local mosque, for example. Uh, you know, create uh, literature that other Muslims can read that will convince them that, look, this is what's going on right now. Uh, uh, like, for example, people should take your podcast and show it to other Muslims, right? Those people that are listening, that are understanding, really need to do more work because mm -hmm. they're one of the few. And they need to take this and they need to take this to the other people and, and show them, look, this is what's happening. This is what's, and we need, we need talented people, people that can write, people that can make posters, people that can make flyers, whatever it is, right? Uh, uh, people that can uh, take information from here and give it to your local khatib. Okay, you know, can you give a khutbah on this topic? Let me give you the information. Listen to this podcast, for example, right? Uh, local people need to do much more at the local. We need to do much more at the, because ultimately, at the end of the day, when the reset comes, you know, I'm on my own, you're on your own, unless you have people around you, unless you have brothers and sisters around you. And, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, you know, we need to work locally. We need to work globally. We need to br bring minds together and we need to understand together what's going on. And we need to come up with solutions together. Uh, everything from how to, you know, do fishing to gr living on the land to, uh, you know, uh, anything else that has to do with survival. Like what type of gear will I need? It's not like I'll be able to take a shower and change clothes every day, right? So um, all those things need to be understood. And so, uh, we need like-minded people to come together, inshallah. That's, that's, and then you need to work locally for, at local level for like-minded people to come together. Inshallah. So, Jazakallah Hiran for those, uh, those in-depth answers. And that, that answered a lot of questions for me. Um, I have a few questions from listeners. So, Ali, you might have- Oh, if this you're is still live? There. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Ali, if you're still there, you might have to resubmit your question because I can't see it in the comments for some reason. Um, so I'm seeing some people are a little discouraged. The main concern right now is the rollout of the VAX. So someone is asking, they said the UK just gave the green light for the VAX and that it's going out ne next week. And then Canada and the US is after December 10th. Um, they're wondering what can they do and they're concerned about this right now, not so much, you know, the development of the Great Reset later on. They're worried about this. Yeah, it's a very tough question. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I've been asking a lot of people myself because uh, while I uh, can say, okay, I'm not going to take the vaccine, 
but not everyone's going to be in that position. You know, there's right. some sister, she has two children, she has her job, her job's going to say, you have to take this before you can come in. So what do you do? Uh, what you, there are options. I'm not, I'm not wanting yet to divulge what you can do if you do take the vaccine. And the reason for that is I want Muslims to not take the vaccine. But right. I do have a solution, which I can come back on your program and discuss it at, at another time once the rollout happens. But there are, I don't want Muslims to lose hope. We don't need to lose hope. Okay. Whatever your situation is, as long as you are being like, you're being real to yourself, right? You have to live your life. No one, we're, we're not going to say, and Allah is not going to want that you die and that you don't like feed your children. So let's be, uh, you know, realistic about that. But let's see where things go in the next two, three months, four months. Let's see where, when things, uh, as things happen. And I do have some solutions in my mind, even if you take the vaccine. But what they are intending to do needs to be kept in mind too. Uh, and I'll say this without like giving too many proofs, but what they're wanting is they want to give you this vaccine that'll get rid of COVID. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this vaccine will have elements in it that is from HIV that attacks your immune system. Then now they're, and, and now they'll be ready to attack you with another pandemic after that. Okay. And so the first ones to get this vaccine will be the doctors and they'll be the first ones to go. Okay, that if things go as they are, it seems like they're planning. Now, I don't know. I could be completely wrong. But if, but if you add one plus one, it's two like that together. If you add, put the dots together, and it's possible that I'm not reading the dots properly. That's possible. But if you read the dots together, it seems like they're doing this to show what a great success this is going to be. Only right. for later on another pandemic to come out, and uh, and then affect everyone with that. And there is many, not many, but some sayings of the prophet to this effect. To this effect, there are sayings of the prophet. So they're gonna. So now uh, you have this, uh, you know, barcoded uh, vaccine inside you uh, that is a complete. Just uh, I mean, I don't even have words to express like. How strange this vaccine is, but uh, yeah. but then there are things you can do after that, even to uh, to uh, to help yourself. Uh, but I'm not going to say because I, if those of you that cannot take it should not take it, then there are things you can do after that, even yeah. And so, uh, inshallah, let let's see where things are four months, five months from now, and then maybe we can have another. Say, because I, if those of you that and then I will take it. Somewhat of what I am saying, a solution, somewhat of a solution so, for people uh, that did take the vaccine but person. didn't want to. And, uh, you know, I know we have a whole Muslim community here, and I know a lot of people will take the vaccine because they feel like they have no choice. Yeah, yeah, they will. And here's the next question. This is kind of off topic, but is there a connection of secularism and a racist dialogue with Allah SWT? when Iblis disobeyed when asked to bow down. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat that? Did that? No, I'm just thinking. Oh, okay, about, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to make if sense. I, if I bring them together at some level. The relationship, one relationship is that, look, Shaitan wants us to, <coughs> Shay, Iblis wants us to go to the hellfire. That's his number one goal. Okay. And so uh, what Iblis does is he lets you make, he puts you in a position where you will be responsible for your decisions, right? And when you bring secularism in, and it's the, it's the big thing, right? Once you bring in secularism, then a lot of other things follow. They, they have to follow. So then riba is okay, and then sexual anarchy is okay and you know immod immodesty is actually frowned upon and so secularism brings all these things that shaitan wants you to do because what is his goal his goal is you do the opposite of what allah says and so secularism allows that door to open that allows you to then have you may yourself be very religious but the whole society as a whole will become uh, 
irreligious. And on that point, I want to mention something very interesting. You know, there was something called the Great American Experiment. Mm. And the Great American Experiment was that, you know, we won't bring, because the idea was religions fight Protestants, Catholics, we're talking about, we're talking within the context of Christianity. So when they came to America, there were all these religious groups, all these different Christians, right? And they didn't want to fight with each other. And so they said, okay, we'll have secularism. But the idea was, is that, look, I'll go to my church, I'll become a better person. You go to your church and you become a better person. But in this public sphere, we won't talk about religion. So we're not at each other's throats. That's how it started. The idea was never to become morally weak. The idea was to become morally strong, but you do it at your own private level. Okay. You go to your church. So what was the result of that great American experiment? The result was that unless, uh, if you don't have religion at the center, then everything begins to fall apart, okay? And so unless you don't have religion at the center, everything begins to fall apart. Having the religious institutions on the sidelines does not help. It actually, be, religion begins to lose over time as it has. So religion has become less and less important in people's lives over the course of the last 200 years. So that's the result of the great American experiment. And so, uh, so that that's where we are. So that's the result of secularism. Sure. Um, next question. Do you think this plan to tackle Islam politically is to try to block the pursuit of becoming of Iman al-Mahdi's upcoming leadership? And they also want to know about the new Israel and Saudi Arabia alliance as Israel just flew their aircrafts over Mecca and it was just on the news. Oh, subhanAllah, I'm not surprised. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, they have been in bed together for a long time. It's just that, you know, when you're, you, you have, you're, you're, it's like behind the closet and then coming out, right? So what's the difference? There's no difference. They just haven't come out yet, but they're only thinking about how to come out and when to come out. And uh, so now they're taking baby steps. So, you know, it's kind of like uh, you tell your parents you're gay for the first time. So that's how they feel. Okay, they feel like they have to take baby steps to tell their public that, you know, we're going to do this. And uh, the public in Saudi Arabia is going to be very anti-government against them once they do. And uh, this is the other thing that Israel is taking advantage of, because the, by its very friendship, which the governments have done, they know that now they have the leaders all cornered against their populace. And it's very easy to create riots and demonstrations against the leaders through Facebook and through these social media outlets, which they create thousands and thousands of fake accounts and then create, you know, protests as a result. And so now, you know, they're, as soon as you accept Israel as a, as, as, as a partner for yourself, any Arab country, at least politically, whether they like it or not, is putting themselves in a situation where it's, their public is against them and Israel can use that to their advantage whenever they want. And do you think that this push for eradicating political Islam has a connection with um, El Mahdi? Uh, I think that uh, within the, the Jewish circles of the rabbis and the Kabbalists and the secret societies, definitely yes. Okay, last question. What kind of advice would you give to someone who understands what's going on, but maybe their family or their friends are either not getting it or are reluctant to get it. Then you should consider that if people are not getting what I'm saying, the problem is not them. The problem is me. Why am I not able to articulate it in a way that they're able to understand what I am seeing? Why are they not seeing what I'm seeing? So maybe try different ways, try to break it down. Maybe sometimes you see something, but the logic isn't there. Like you see the picture, but you're not able to connect the dots. So, you know, it takes time. That's the other thing. People don't accept things just because you said it, right? It takes years for people to begin to see things. And uh, so you have to not be like uh, discouraged, okay? You have to, and don't try to tell them everything in one, don't give one big injection. Start with one piece and then another piece and then another piece and another piece. That way you'll have more success, inshallah. It's, it's just like how da'wah is done. When you meet a non-Muslim and you want to tell him about Islam, and if you just tell him the first day, okay, Islam is the truth, I want you to accept it. 
that's not going to work, right? You have to break it down. You have to tell them the concepts. You have to tell them about oneness of Allah. You have to tell them about what Islam stands for. So you have to kind of break it down. Like you, we have to literally do that one to our Muslim brothers and sisters and explain to them what's going on. And I think uh, that at least for my part, I can say that I have failed at this. It's, it, the problem is not them. Because you see, Muslims have good intentions, generally speaking. Yes, there are those that are, how many Muslims are denying the Great Reset intentionally? No, that's not the case. The problem is we've, that there are very few scholars that have understood it, number one. And number two, uh, we haven't uh, been successful yet to uh, show to our community that this is the way things are going. The problem is me and you. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I can see that. Uh, another question: What is your opinion on Hijra of leaving the West at this time? If you can do it, uh, particularly to certain places, then you should do it. What do you think about? Because you're not going to be able to escape this fully anywhere. There's going to be elements of it. Do you think that some places are better than others? Yeah, wherever there's more like-minded people, it's better. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if 12,000 Muslims come together, they cannot be overcome. Okay, an example of that in history is Taliban. Uneducated people, you may call them, but they defeated the United States of America and America is withdrawing from Afghanistan today. Okay, so 12,000. Uh, the Prophet said, they will not be, 12,000 people will not be overcome, but because of lack of numbers. But they have to be together using the Islamic discipline with an Amir, with a Shura, with, you know, human differences will occur and all of that. But, but that unity of 12,000 Muslims coming together will have great barakah, great barakah. And in Muslims in America, one of the things that we need to do, like in, Amer in the American context, and, and then Muslims in Europe and so on and so forth, we need to look for a coming together of 12,000 people. This is going to be our insurance policy, inshallah, under the words of the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet said, right. 12,000 will not be overcome because of lack of numbers. So that doesn't mean you won't have hardship but it means you won't be overcome. You will survive. And so I would be very happy to have a coalition of 12,000 Muslims together on, on, in, with one stance here in the US, for example. And Muslims in England can easily do that, uh, given the chance. So one of the takeaways from this is to not lose hope. No, keep working. At least Allah will protect you if you keep going. Yeah. Well, Sheikh, this was, like I said, this was incredible. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. Keep up the good work, inshallah. And may Allah use you for his... Engaging his... with us to discuss this because it's, it's... Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So inshallah, you'll come back on again? Yes, inshallah, I will. Okay, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you, Jazakallah khair, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum. Okay, as-salamu alaykum.